This is going to be great. Um, so a little bit about Dr. David Eiler, who's with us tonight, talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, he completed his psychiatry residency here at Dartmouth Hitchcock and has been an attending physician since July of 2018. He serves as the director of the Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation, or TMS, clinic, and we'll learn more about that. And he's also involved in the Mood Disorders Clinic and the Electroconvulsive Therapy ECT service. He's also a member of the DH Suicide Prevention Committee, currently exploring implementation of the zero suicide methodology within DHMC. So without further ado, I'm gonna throw it over to Dr. Eiler and um, let him get started on his presentation. Dr. Eiler. Thanks, thanks for the introduction, Angelica. Thanks to everyone for attending. Um, and thanks for bearing with us during the, uh, what seemed to be inevitable technical uh, issues whenever we have a large Zoom presentation. Um, so as Angelica said, um, my name is Dr. Dave Eiler. Um, I'm an attending psychiatrist here at Dartmouth Hitchcock, um, also the, the clinical medical director of the Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation or TMS clinic. Um, and that's primarily what I'll be uh, talking about this evening. Um, when I was getting ready for this presentation, I really went back um, primarily to all the conversations I've had with patients um, over the couple of years I've been doing this. Um, and so I, you know, tried to anticipate questions, um, you know, that you may well have, um, and tried to answer those as best I can. But at the end, to the extent that I miss, um, you know, or incompletely answer uh, questions that you have, we'll have time for that. So um, now, if you'll just bear with me for a second, I am going to um, switch to presentation mode. Okay, so that's working for me, and uh, I think you should be seeing the, the slides. If there are any problems um, and I don't uh, identify them, uh, hopefully Angelica will break in and, and let us know. Hi, Dr. Eiler, we're not seeing the slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, perfect. So you, you let us know. <laughs> uh, because, and that was my fault, because I ignored a critical step. I think this will do it. How's that? That looks good. Okay, thank you. So um, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, we have our TMS clinic um, within the larger uh, mood disorders clinic. The Mood Disorders Clinic um, is a consulting service. Um, so we take referrals uh, from uh, mostly from uh, other psychiatrists who want us uh, or whose patients want additional um, opinion or advice on, on treatment. And so the Mood Disorders Clinic focuses on um, difficult to treat depression. And what we do in that clinic um, is several things. Um, we always begin with a thorough personalized evaluation of each patient. And, um, and then we have the goal after that evaluation of making different types of recommendations, um, medication, treatment recommendations, and referral to, to psychotherapy. Um, and also we refer to, um, to other forms of treatment, uh, which can include um, what we'll be talking about primarily this evening, things like TMS um, and uh, electroconvulsive therapy, UCT. So but before I talk about TMS at um, more length, I'd like to just say a few things about depression in general. Um, you know, depression, as, as many of you probably understand, is often a debilitating condition. Um, it's often chronic, uh, and or recurring. I can go on for decades um, for many patients. Symptoms include persistent sadness, loss of pleasure in, in doing things, 
lack of energy, uh, problems with appetite, sleep, concentration, memory, um, and a number of other symptoms that, that again can be you know, crippling for patients and really impair quality of life, ability to work. Also when a person suffers from depression, um, the person's family and friends are, are often um, also affected um, in many ways. And depression, as I think many realize, is increasingly recognized as um, a major public health problem. Um, and I just you know, wanted to present a couple um, examples of that. The lifetime prevalence, um, which in the US, which is essentially um, the likelihood that a, that a person will experience depression at least once in his or her lifetime um, is around one in five. So around one in five of us will, will have some experience with clinical depression at least once. Um, and then the 12 month prevalence, which you know, means in a given year, what's the likelihood um, of experiencing depression is, is even one in 10. Um, you know, so it's a very common problem. Um, and it's a problem that um, those kinds of, um, you know, uh, prevalences translate in, into a very large societal cost, uh, at least one estimate of which um, annually is around $200 billion, which for just for um, comparison's sake is about the uh, estimated GDP of Ecuador. So it's a, so it's a big problem. Um, and, and for individuals and for society as, as a whole. And I also you know, would be remiss if I didn't mention that for many people are finding that, that their depression um, is either emerging in the era of COVID, um, you know, first time depression or, or is quite a bit worse. And you know, I've had many patients tell me that this is um, you know, a very difficult time for them. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, additional life stresses, the kinds of things that contribute to depression uh, for many people uh, all the time have gotten a lot worse for many people. Um, social isolation, financial distress, and also um, impaired access to mental health care. So the fortunate thing about depression, um, at least I see it that way, is that we really have um, a large and growing uh, toolbox of ways to treat depression. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the, what we call the first line approaches to treatment, um, which include antidepressant medication and psychotherapy or talk therapy. Um, those two have been the mainstays and continue to be the mainstays of, of treatment of depression. And uh, you know, together or, or separately work for many patients. Um, Something that too that we've come to learn uh, in the treatment of depression, uh, an important finding that's been reinforced with much research is that in treatment of depression, what we call a multimodal approach often works better than individual um, than treatment with just a single modality of treatment. And so here by modality of treatment, I mean um, sort of a type of treatment. Antidepressant medication would be one modality psychotherapy would be another modality. And um, this graph illustrates um, sort of a truism um, that we find in, uh, in mental health care that when we combine modalities of treatment, we often get an overall better result. Um, not always, but, but frequently. Another way to think about this is that if we have, um, if we consider the, the set of all patients with depression, and we treat them with uh, psychotherapy versus medication, we'll find that uh, a certain subset respond to medication, have a good result. Uh, another group will find therapy effective. And then the overlap of those two groups will be people who get benefit from both types of, both modalities of treatment. Um, and so again, we see that um, for some patients, they get benefit by adding additional modalities of treatment. Uh, each one will sort of give them some additional benefit. Unfortunately, what we also see in this diagram um, is that some patients get left out of, of the effectiveness 
sets. Um, in other words, there are significant subset of patients for whom repeated trials of psychotherapy and medication, including different medications and combinations of medications, um, are, are still significantly depressed. So what do you do? Well, fortunately, um, we have additional modalities of treatment. In other words, types of treatment that work in a significantly different way from medications or psychotherapy. And so they seem to work for a different subset of patients um, and often can add uh, benefit on top of the sort of first line types of treatment. When a patient um, falls into this group um, of patients who have tried multiple kinds of medication, um, often multiple uh, cycles of psychotherapy and, and is still depressed, uh, that's what we term treatment resistant depression, which is, uh, or TRD, which is something that you'll, you know, I'll mention throughout this, um, the rest of this presentation, but you may also be encountering um, elsewhere when you do your own research or talk to other providers. So how do we define treatment resistant depression? Um, it's not a very precisely defined concept. Um, most practitioners will consider a patient's depression to be treatment resistant if there have been um, a few fails of medication trials, um, usually across more than one type of medication, um, and also a failure at least of one trial of psychotherapy. So this is a rather busy diagram, somewhat technical, um, but I put it up there um, to illustrate how uh, mental health providers often think about treatment resistance and, and treatment resistant depression. This is the algorithm, the treatment algorithm for the, uh, a very famous, at least among psychiatrists, very famous trial called the STAR-D trial, um, which was done to compare different approaches to treatment for depression to see which might be better. Um, and so without going into a lot of detail, the, you know, the essential point that was discovered was that when you look at the trade-offs between risks and benefits, most people start will benefit starting from with a, an SSRI. Um, anyone who's had depression is likely to have tried um, an SSRI, uh, something like uh, Celexa or Citalopram, um, Zoloft, Prozac, so forth. Um, but but for those pa for uh, patients with depression, many of them will not um, get completely better uh, with a trial, one trial of medication. And so we, um, we try other medications. We um, sometimes add medications that work in different ways pharmacologically, um, and we add psychotherapy. And we use studies like this, the STAR-D study uh, to help us make evidence-based um, scientific, if you will, decisions about how to escalate treatment um, for patients who don't respond to the first things that we try. So, you know, that's sort of the, the technical or, or the professional's view of treatment resistant depression for patients. Um, you know, all they know is that it, it's a devastating experience to have a depression that can go on for years and even decades um, and, and not respond or, or not fully respond to a series of treatments. Um, this tends to lead to frustration for a lot of patients. Um, many patients I talk to get very anxious um, on top of their depression. Um, you know, will I ever find a, a cure or something that really works for me? Um, and unfortunately, some patients even um, become hopeless. And these kinds of emotions, which are very you know, natural re reactions to a persistent illness, um, can then make the depression symptoms themselves worse. So it, the two problems end up sort of reinforcing each other. Um, so treatment of treatment resistant depression, um, as I alluded to earlier when talking about the mood disorder clinic, um, starts with a thorough evaluation. And um, this is often challenging for patients because they've answered these same questions over and over again. But it is very important that we understand the timeline of a patient's depression, how it started, when it started, and all the things that have been tried um, up to the present day, 
what things have worked, what things haven't worked, um, side effects that have been experienced. Um, and we do this type of evaluation in the mood disorder clinic. And then um, we typically identify multiple contributing factors to a patient's uh, depression. Many will have genetic factors, um, which are really means a family history um, of depression. People will also have had experiences in childhood or later in life that contributed to their depression. Um, there will be stresses ongoing in their lives. Um, and of course, there can be other medical issues in the background um, or the foreground that um, contribute to depression. So based on that personalized evaluation, we develop a personalized treatment strategy. Um, we, we start by looking at the first line treatments, of course, and looking for medication strategies that may have been missed. And it's not uncommon that we will um, we'll have a suggestion um, for medication, which you know, wasn't tried before, even though many things were, and, and that can be um, a turning point for a patient. We also sometimes find the patients have not had certain types of psychotherapy that can be particularly effective. Um, and so that ends up being a breakthrough for a patient. But when those things do not, um, you know, don't provide the answer, um, and, you know, we've addressed as best we can contributing factors, um, which we can't always fix, but, but sometimes can, or at least can improve. Um, when those things don't, uh, provide the complete solution, um, we start to think about neuromodulation. So the term neuromodulation, which is um, you know, somewhat technical, somewhat um, obscure, um, but it really has a fairly simple um, concept behind it. Uh, it encompasses a variety of treatments that have essentially one thing in common. They all use one form or another of electromagnetic magnetic stimulation. Um, examples include electroconvulsive therapy, um, ECT, which is also sometimes um, unfortunately called shock therapy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, but that has uh, been around for a long time, um, very effective and generally quite safe. Um, and uh, TMS, what we're focusing on today, is an example of neuromodulation. There are others, um, other acronyms. DCS stands for direct current stimulation, some may have heard of. Um, VNS is vagal nerve stimulation. DBS stands for deep brain stimulation. These techniques we won't talk about in great detail. Um, VNS and DBS are more invasive, require surgery, um, and they all are supported by considerably less evidence compared to uh, TMS and ECT. Um, but you know, there are things that sometimes I looked into for patients with the most difficult depression. So getting back to our um, diagram, um, what we're doing with TMS or ECT neuromodulation in general really is, is capturing another subset of all the depressed patients, um, there will be people who uh, have failed to respond to psychotherapy, to medication, who respond to TMS. Um, and we see that um, really um, routinely, um, not for every patient, but for a significant portion of patients uh, who've had incomplete response to more conventional treatments. In terms of our bar graph, we've really just added another, um, another bar that represents adding another modality. Um, and so this graph really is, illustrates two points. <clears throat> Firstly, many patients will uh, experience significant improvement in the depression when we add TMS for them. And secondly, um, TMS is most commonly, and, and I think, often most effectively used as what we call an adjunctive treatment, which means it's used together with medication and or psychotherapy, um, usually that the 
the patient is already on um, and that is simply not um, fully relieving their depression. So uh, what is TMS? Well, this is what it looks like. <clears throat> um, this is uh, almost exactly what our uh, setup looks like in the clinic. There are many different types of magnets. You may see different uh, you setups um, in advertisements, um, but they all work in essentially the same way. This uh, is a cartoon, a simple picture that just uh, illustrates how we think TMS works. Um, the magnet is an electromagnet. Uh, we're able to produce an alternating magnetic field in that magnet, and it's placed just gently against the scalp over a particular region of the brain. And the alternating magnetic field creates uh, very weak electrical currents within certain uh, brain circuits. Um, and these are circuits that are believed to be working abnormally in patients who are depressed. So the safety and effectiveness of TMS for depression have been established in multiple studies. Um, this is just one example with regard to effectiveness. Um, this was a study, uh, so-called sham controlled trial, which means that uh, patients were randomized, put into two groups. Um, some, uh, one group got actual TMS and the other group got what's called sham TMS, which actually uses a, a coil that replicates some of the um, really sort of um, experience of TMS without actually um, having any efficacy. <clears throat> and as this graph shows, patients who were in the actual TMS group had a significantly better um, you know, improvement in their depression. So in addition to being uh, shown to be effective, TMS is also um, across many studies have been, has been found to be generally safe and well tolerated. There are side effects um, that, are, that are common, almost, almost universal scalp pain to some degree. Um, facial twitching can also happen because the magnet can um, activate uh, other nerves in the face, superficial nerves and muscles. Um, and perhaps uh, around half of patients um, will get headache. Um, it's a tension headache. Um, TMS does not cause migraine, but I always tell patients who have migraine um, that it's conceivable TMS may uh, temporarily exacerbate or make worse their migraine experience. Um, but the most important aspect of the, side, the common side effects of TMS, I think, is first of all, it rarely prevents a patient from completing treatment. Um, some patients are bothered more, some less, uh, but most get used to the, the side effects and tolerate the treatments well. And also the common side effects are uh, temporary. And once you're no longer having TMS, um, they, they won't persist. There is one uh, type of risk that is medically, <clears throat> I would say medically significant, but extremely unlikely to occur. And that's uh, an unintended seizure. We do not, with TMS, um, intend to cause a seizure. That's not part of the therapy, <clears throat> but it can conceivably happen by accident. We screen patients for risks um, that might increase their risk of, um, of having a seizure caused by TMS. But patients, for patients who do not have any um, pre-existing conditions that make them more likely, more vulnerable to seizure, the risk is extremely low um, and has been compared to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the risk of, of having a seizure caused by a trial of a new, of a new medication. There are some contraindications, um, conditions that uh, mean that you shouldn't have TMS, that it would likely not be safe. Um, a big one is implanted metal. Um, 
certain, certainly any implanted metal in the head um, is pretty much an absolute, is an absolute contraindication. These are pictures that represent uh, stents in blood vessels. If these are um, intracranial, um, in other words, um, aneurysm stents um, in the brain, then TMS would be unsafe. Cardiac stents are, are generally safe, but we do a, you know, an individual assessment to make sure um, that that's the case for each, each patient for whom it, it's relevant. Pacemakers and uh, implanted defibrillator um, also are unsafe in the setting of TMS. Patients who have a history of epilepsy or seizures, um, this, the asterisk there means that it's not an absolute contraindication, um, but it's a serious concern. That's again, something that we um, consider on a case by case basis. And active substance abuse is an issue mainly because um, it interferes with the efficacy of the TMS and it also um, complicates the diagnosis of depression. So we generally require that patients be abstinent uh, at least for a number of months, ideally for a year or more before um, trying TMS. And there are other medical conditions that um, we consider when evaluating a patient for TMS. Um, and that's just, that's part of the mood disorder clinic evaluation. So um, another really important topic for patients is the treatment schedule. Uh, a typical uh, treatment schedule for TMS consists of a total of 36 treatments spread out over nine weeks. The first six weeks, it's Monday through Friday. And then we have uh, for the subsequent three weeks, weeks seven, eight, and nine, we have what's called a taper where we gradually decrease the frequency. In week seven, we have three treatments. In week eight, we have two, and then the final treatment in week nine. Now this is um, what I've depicted here is sort of the ideal schedule, but certainly there is flexibility. Patients can miss a treatment here or there. We can rearrange times and things without disrupting the effectiveness of the treatment. Um, but we do say that if a patient is gonna be away for a whole week, a couple of weeks, then probably we should um, you know, schedule at a different time. Um, or you know, otherwise stated, we should pick a block of time at least the first six weeks, the patient should be expecting to be able to, to do the treatments um, on a regular basis. Oh, and I should say that the treatments themselves, um, the treatment appointments are, are actually quite brief now. The um, initial appointment takes 45 minutes or we allow that much time um, and there's, some initial preliminary uh, tasks to complete, but the beyond, after that, the, the typical treatment appointment is um, you're in and out in 15 minutes. A lot of people ask, um, a lot of patients ask me, how does TMS compare with ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which people are often more familiar with, or at least they've, they've heard of it or seen it on television in some setting. So, in terms of the evidence supporting its use, ECT has been around for decades. Um, it's been tested. Uh, research has been done on thousands of patients. So we have a very large body of evidence supporting the effectiveness of ECT. Uh, for TMS, we have substantial evidence, but not as much as for ECT because TMS has is, is not been in use as long. In terms of effectiveness, also, um, ECT is by far the most effective treatment we have for depression on average um, and across all patients. It also has the advantage of being effective uh, and, and being FDA approved for other types of depression such as bipolar depression. TMS uh, is less effective, it, it tend, but, but significantly effective as, as you've seen. It, um, it generally works for about half of patients um, who take it when they're adding it to their pre-existing 
treatments. Side effects, however, is where TMS, I think, really shines um, as an option. There are very mild side effects, and they are entirely temporary, whereas ECT has more significant side effects um, and also has the potential in some patients to cause some memory side effects that may be permanent. And in terms of insurance coverage, um, ECT, when it's clinically indicated, is, um, in my experience, at least essentially always, pretty much always covered by insurance. And uh, whereas TMS is generally covered, um, but there is a burden of proof that most insurers require, which essentially amounts to demonstrating that the diagnosis of treatment resistant depression is supported by the patient's documented history. So additional advantages of TMS is just things that I've learned over the years are um, things that patients care about for various reasons. Again, I mentioned there aren't any cognitive side effects, uh, doesn't cause problems with memory or thinking. Um, there's no anesthesia required, whereas ECT does require anesthesia. You can drive yourself home from appointments and you don't have any restrictions to your activity for, rest, for the rest of the day. Um, by comparison, ECT really pretty much takes, takes you out for a day. Um, and some patients complain that they're not the same for a couple of days, but, but typically uh, for the rest of that day, you're recovering with ECT, whereas with TMS, you come in and then you go about your day. So uh, in summary, TMS is a new, at least um, for most patients, a new treatment modality for treatment resistant depression. It works well for about half the patients who try it. It's generally safe and well tolerated. It does require significant commitment of time and travel. I'll also just briefly note that while currently the only FDA approved indication for TMS is treatment of depression. And uh, that means that that's the only indication that insurance will typically cover. There is um, significant research ongoing looking at TMS for anxiety, um, for OCD, uh, I misspoke. There is um, a limited indication uh, there's a particular type of treatment coil, proprietary, um, one that we don't use, in fact, um, but that has been approved for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and it's also, TMS is also being studied heavily uh, for PTSD. And many other indications are being looked at, um, everything from Parkinson's to Alzheimer's to chronic pain. Um, and so I, I'm optimistic that over the coming years, we will have more and more things we can do with TMS to help patients. And that's all I have. So I've got here some contact information um, in case anyone is uh, interested in contacting the clinic to find out more. We have a website uh, that has additional information. Um, and you're always welcome to call or email the Mood Disorders Clinic um, and ask any questions you have. Thank you very much. Now we'll take questions if there are any. Great, thank you, Dr. Eiler. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, and you, you may have alluded to this, um, but does, uh, does a patient have to have treatment resistant depression in order to qualify for TMS? So that's, that's a good question. It's one of the most basic questions that we, um, that we need to answer with each patient. Um, the basic answer is yes. You do have to have treatment resistant depression. How that's defined varies somewhat by, uh, from insurer to insurer. Um, I'm trying to get my your video back up. My video on, yes. Um, in general, 
most insurance providers will require that a patient have tried uh, three or four different medications in at least two different medication classes. So say one or two SSRIs and maybe an SNRI or Wellbutrin. Um, most insurers will also require at least one trial of what's called augmentation, where you add another medication to an antidepressant. And all insurers I'm, I'm aware of require at least one trial of psychotherapy. So you have to have tried all those things and still have significant depression. And how long do the, the effects of TMS generally last? Well, that's also a really good question. Um, we find that you know, depression is a, is a recurring disease. The likelihood of recurrence, regardless of what um, treatment we're talking about, the likelihood of recurrence increases the more times a patient has, has experienced depression. Um, and the recurrence time is typically anywhere from three to 12 months. So um, as with medication, if you you know, if a person becomes depressed, takes a medication, it works well. And then after six months or a year, they discontinue the medication. There's a significant likelihood that at some point the patient will experience depression again. The same is true with TMS. Um, the likelihood of becoming depressed again um, is lower if you continue other treatments, if you continue taking an antidepressant that has provided some benefit in the past. Um, if you continue with psychotherapy, but um, it's not uncommon for a patient to um, have depression recur or get worse again, three, six, 12 months out. Um, we have had patients come back and uh, in those situations, if TMS has worked well for a patient and then depression returns, insurers will often uh, pay for another uh, cycle of TMS and um, that's often effective again. Um, and then we have a question about, um, about seizures and you talked about seizures being a possible side effect. Um, and yeah. what is the percentage of people who would, would exhibit that? Well, it, it certainly seems to be less than one in a thousand. Um, when we're talking about people who don't have any um, big risk factors for seizures. The biggest risk factor for seizure is a history of seizures. Other things that can increase seizure risk are certain medications, um, a history of significant head trauma or surgery uh, to the brain, those kinds of things. So, you know, we ask, uh, we, we have a, a form that everyone uh, fills out a questionnaire where we ask a whole series of questions. Um, it's, you know, just one page, but it, but it encompasses uh, you know, a fairly wide range of risk factors that we want to make sure we, we're aware of. Um, and then we have somebody asking um, about the treatment effectiveness for different patients currently suffering from multiple mood disorders simultaneously. Um, it, how effective is, is TMS for people who have, you know, multiple well, the, yeah. Yeah. So good question. Um, it's very common for patients to have more than one diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a patient might have a major depressive disorder and a generalized anxiety disorder. Okay. Um, the, the FDA approval is for treatment of depression. Um, and uh, I'm not aware of any evidence, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I'm not aware of any evidence that the effectiveness is different um, for a patient for a patient's depression when there are other diagnoses present. Um, it it can you know other diagnoses that are present can also can make depression worse, can make the treatment of the depression more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, in general, TMS is still indicated. It still works. I it's not possible for me to predict for a particular patient um, how the result might differ, but but I certainly, um, I would say it's as, as often as not, patients who have depression have other concerns as well, 
um, most commonly anxiety that can go with depression. Um, but you know, we've treated patients with other additional diagnoses and found it to be effective. Great, great. And then we have a question um, about the mood disorder clinic. Is there are there any plans for it to move beyond the Dartmouth Lebanon location, or is it just kind of a travel? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, right now, this is the only location where we have such a clinic. It's certainly something that we um, would be interested in looking into of talk, you know, it's it's a wish list sort of thing that we would like to do at some point, but, but there aren't any um, immediate plans to do that. And unfortunately, the to the, the COVID um, situation has um, Slowed, slowed us down on a number of fronts. In fact, we, you know, we had to pause the TMS clinic for several months um, because of that. Right, right. And and what is the process for someone who is interested in in in, in this therapy? Like, yeah. how do you go? So we would call, they would call the the number, and then what are, what is the, the next steps? What does that look well, like? We, we like patients to have a referral from a provider um, that can be a psychiatrist, it can be a primary care provider, um, but I, I think it's important that the patient have a someone caring for, for them um, on a regular basis. It's not uncommon for patients to be, you know, to not have a psychiatrist necessarily, but have a primary care doctor who's prescribing an antidepressant, for example, um, and the patient's tried a number of them and is still depressed. And so we, we see patients on that basis. Um, sometimes our recommendations will include that the patient establish care with a psychiatrist. I, I generally think that if a patient has treatment resistant depression, then that patient should have a relationship with a psychiatrist um, because that treatment of treatment resistant depression is really a more specialized thing. And um, most primary care doctors um, just don't, that's not their area of expertise. Um, but we will accept um, referrals from non-psychiatrists. Okay, so when the referral is made, then they would um, make an appointment and then yeah. uh, there's a consultation process or? Yeah, we'll make an appointment for a mood disorder or consultation um, the patient is seen in that clinic, which currently is a, you know, a telehealth clinic. Okay. Um, we have a, an evaluation, uh, which is typically a 60 minute appointment. And um, towards the end of that, we discuss, we, we work out with the patient a um, treatment strategy, which usually includes a number of recommendations. Um, psychotherapy recommendations would be acted upon um, by the patient, the patient will go, you know, uh, find a therapist and undertake the therapies that are recommended if, if they want to do that. Medication recommendations um, are typically prescribed by the whoever was prescribing for the patient previously. So we, we don't take over the patient's um, follow-up care and, and, and prescribe going forward. We make a recommendation a detailed recommendation and then whoever is the patient's prescriber, whether a psychiatrist or a primary care doctor will, will then do the prescribing. Um, and then when it's appropriate, we'll, we refer patient to our own TMS clinic typically, um, or conceivably, a, you know, certainly if a, if a patient um, is appropriate for TMS, but lives closer to some other place where they would prefer to get TMS, then that would be fine too. Um, and similarly, for electroconvulsive therapy for ECT, we often refer patients there. And again, uh, most of those patients end up getting their ECT here. But um, if they have a more convenient location for that, that, that would be fine. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. If anybody wants to use the Q&A section uh, to ask your questions, please feel free. Um, and yeah. Otherwise, I think 
this has been a really great. Um, thank you, Dr. Eiler, so much for being a part thank you. of Thanks our Healthy everyone. Living thank series. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, but again, we're very appreciative of everyone's time um, for coming. There will be a survey sent to your email um, at the close of this event. So please feel free to send your feedback um, and that will help us with future programming. We do have a couple of Healthy Living Series events coming up in the next month. Uh, one is about um, maternity care and child and having a baby in this new age. Um, and the other one is going to be um, on mental health again, uh, is, is so important right now uh, and um, getting through seasonal depression, um, especially during the COVID-19 restrictions. And that will be in partnership with NAMI New Hampshire. And that one is gonna be on November 11th. If anyone is interested, um, information is forthcoming. We don't have everything um, down pat yet, but we will very soon. Um, so, Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Eiler, again for joining Thank you. us. Um, and everyone, please have a good night. Again, this event will be posted on our YouTube page um, and on our social media outlets for, um, for another viewing if you're interested. So thank you so much and have a great night. Good night.